And this is how pastors make small talk. It's, it's safe, right? Because you don't know for sure who they might know in your congregation, so you can't complain about the annoying people at your church. And you, you, you probably shouldn't talk about your personal problems because you never know who they might report it to and that might make you look bad and pastors are always worried about looking good. So, you talk about what you're going to preach about. It's really safe. It sounds like you're talking about something more substantial than the weather, but really you're just making small talk and you're, they choose that topic, I believe, because it's safe. You can't get in trouble talking about what you're going to preach about next Sunday. But when you tell pastors that you're speaking on Zephaniah the next time you're preaching, they, they kind of wrinkle, why would you do that? Some of the pastors who I told that I was preaching, because I was recently at a large conference of students in Glorieta, New Mexico, and there were hundreds of ministers there, most of them from across the southern U.S., but several of my colleagues in student ministry from across Canada all convened there. The Southern Baptist money bags in the South pay for our flight and pay for our, our lodging and food while we're there at this conference. And so it's cheaper for us Canadian ministers to go to New Mexico to meet once a year to have a to to talk about how student ministry is going across Canada than it would be for us to gather someplace in Canada. Because we're spread. There's people in Montreal and Vancouver and Calgary and Edmonton. And we all get together, and in Toronto, and we all get together in New Mexico. And it's cheaper than flying somewhere in Canada. Because we don't pay anything for it. So we're there. And I'm meeting with all of those ministers, but I'm also meeting dozens of pastors from across the U.S. every single day. And so what are you talking about? So, do you have to prepare a sermon for when you get back? Yeah, not long after I get back, I'm speaking at this church. Oh yeah? What are you speaking on? Zephaniah? Zephaniah? Why would you want to do that? You ever wanted to slap somebody? I mean, really slap them? You know, like, like hard enough to, to make them see the, the presence of God briefly? To make them briefly assume that they might be ushered into God's holy presence forever? Just at that moment, they see a bright light at the end of the long center aisle, and they realize, no, it's not Jesus, it's just the street is sunny. And so they come back, but just for a moment, they think they're being ushered into the throne room of God. That's how I feel when people talk to me about the minor prophets, because they will describe them as boring. They're like, oh, that's so boring. It's so out of date. It's so, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is the word of God, and it's not out of date. I don't know if you've heard any of that which I read. The worst thing in the world to do, especially in our society, is to read a lengthy passage of scripture. It just loses everybody's attention. But I don't know if you've heard the, the power of the stuff that I was reading, but it's talking about the day of the Lord. The early part of Zephaniah, all the way through to the verse where I started, talks about judgment. It talks about how Israel has wandered from God, and God is going to come back and judge them. And it talks specifically about how he's going to use foreign armies to do that. And you know, a long time ago, in Jewish history, that's exactly what happened. In 586, the Babylonian army marched in, and they took Jerusalem, and they took many of the people off into exile, and those they left behind, they left in a crumbled, ruined city, barely able to feed themselves. They'd burned crops and taken all the valuables, and they took the leaders all with them, and the people that were left behind barely survived the first few years. And when, they, when the exiles came back some 70 years later, the, the mess they still saw that they were shocked that the cities hadn't been rebuilt. The walls were still in crumbled messes. It still looked like the scenes we see after the Japanese tsunami, right, where things are just a mess. They're still a mess. But 70 years later, they were still a mess. It was bad. But this is talking about the restoration. And while part of the restoration happened 70 years after the exile, I think that part of this is still to come. It talks about how on that day, on that great and glorious day, God will come and live personally among them. I don't know if you caught that. But the people that are mourning, the people that are impoverished and struggling and dealing with, with the consequences of God's wrath, dealing with the consequences of that punishment, dealing with crumpled cities and ruined crops, 
barely able to feed their families, will rejoice. That they'll be rewarded for waiting faithfully. That they will be blessed. It talks about how all of the pride will be taken from them. All of the, the proud people will be gone. Everybody will be brought humble. You know, literally having to scramble for food. Having to, to scrape and crawl and beg and dig for food will make you humble. You may, you may think you're pretty, pretty proud, but you know, enough time spent on your hands and knees digging for a potato that might be there in a partially trampled garden that might still be preserved under the ground. Because you haven't eaten anything in two days, and that potato will be the best thing you ever ate, dirt and all, <laughs> when, you, when you finally pull it out of there. That'll kind of strip away some of the ego. <laughs> you haven't got much room left for ego. You'll shrink up a little. I'd shrink up a lot. <laughs> I might look positively Chinese by the time I was done. The, the, uh, <laughs> the, there just won't be, be any room left in you for evil. So it talks about how the, the humble will be rewarded. It talks about what it means to have the presence of God living right there in their midst. This is something that the, the Jewish people had never seen, but had always longed to see. You know, the, the original plan for the Jewish people was not that they'd have a king like the other nations. The original plan was that God himself would be their king, that they would look to God as their king, and that God's messages delivered through the high priest and the prophets would direct the steps of the people in such a way that they would have God as their king, and they would be an example to all the other nations, because they would be different than all the other nations. For instance, they wouldn't have a king. But if you look at the end of the book of Judges, what do the people start to complain? At the start of Samuel, what do they say? They say exactly the opposite. They say, we want to be like the other people. Give us a king. And so they choose a king, and then another, and another. And there are some good kings, and there are some bad kings. If you read through the books of kings, you read chronicles of the kings of Israel, you see there's good ones and there's bad ones, but they're just like every other place. There are good leaders and there are bad leaders. We in Canada have good politicians and bad politicians, and they, they, you kind of survive, with the, make the best of it as you're going along, because what else are you going to do? You know, every four years you get a chance to vote here, and you don't get that when you have a king, but, I mean, I don't really feel like, while it's, I know, I work for elections up there, I know it's important to cast your vote and all this I don't feel like my one vote really makes much of a difference. Yeah, I know I have my voice, but it's hard to feel heard. The people I vote for rarely win. I always seem to pick the wrong team. <laughs> and I even switch once in a while. I still somehow manage to be on the wrong side every time. The, these people had, had a king. Their kings, especially by the time of Zephaniah, had led them astray. The kings were the ones leading the people towards idolatry towards sin, towards selfishness. And so the punishment was coming. Zephaniah had predicted that. But then he also predicts this restoration, where God again will be their king, where God will live in the midst of the people. You know, the part of, I like best about this is as you get to the end of the passage, it actually talks about God rejoicing over them, celebrating them, singing them a love song. positively beautiful. If you allow yourself to be taken up by that image, it's breathtaking. The fact that the God of the universe will come and live among his people and will sing love songs to them. And you can tell everybody that this is your song. It may seem quite simple, but now that it's done, I hope you don't mind, I hope you don't mind That I wrote down in words How wonderful life is Now you're in the world You know, that's Elton 
Elton John, <laughs> best covered by Ewan McGregor in Moulin Rouge, that the fact is that's the heart of God. The passage, this passage reveals that, that God wants to live among his people and his attitude to each and every one of the humble and the lowly among his people, the people that have been oppressed and downtrodden, the people that are suffering, that his heart for them is that they would understand that how he feels about them, no matter how they feel about their lives, no matter how, when they look at the condition of their lives and say, no, this is miserable, maybe God doesn't like me, that God's true heart for each and every one of those people is that life is wonderful now that they're here, that they, each of them is a precious and cherished child of God. He longs to sing a love song like that to each and every one of his children. That's what it says here in Zephaniah. It says that then, once all of that has happened, and all of that has taken place, that the people, everyone, will see that his chosen people are being rejoiced over in such a way, by such a God, that they will have no choice but to join in. <laughs> These are amazing people. Look at the relationship they have with God. It's like one giant love on all the time in there. They're just, they so are in love with God, and God is so in love with them, and they're being so richly blessed. How can we not also rejoice that these people are in our midst? And they too will celebrate those people. They too will celebrate God's chosen people. The people from the surrounding areas will take note of it, and they'll join in the party. They'll join in the song. Now you might, if you're a saved person, and you're paying attention, you might be asking yourself, well that's nice, but how does it, what does it mean for me? Because that's about the Jewish people, about their restoration. It's some promise that one of their prophets delivered to them. Six, no, wait, 2,600 years ago. What is that, what's the, what, why would that make any difference to me? Well, here's what I think. There are two ways to understand the passage. One of them is to understand it just as applying to those Jewish people that the promise was delivered directly to. That it just applies to them. And at some point, there will be a restoration of the nation of Israel. Some people thought it was going to happen after the Second World War when the nation of Israel was restored eventually. That people think it's still coming, some people. And they think about it literally applying to Israel. From the evidence of the text, it's tough to argue against that as an incorrect interpretation. But I understand it to apply a bit more. Because when I think about the day of the Lord, and the presence of God living directly among His people, Him coming to live among them and be their king and be their guide and be their, their sustenance, for Him to deliver the lowly and the humble to raise them up, to, to, to vanquish the proud, I, I start to think about the New Testament. I start to think about the application of this with the Gospel in mind, with the work of Jesus in mind. And then when I start to think about God's presence living among His chosen people, I start to think about the way the Holy Spirit indwells the church. And the way that we as a group, we as a church, become the living representative of the body of Christ. And I see a, a different kind of, a more applicable game at play. I, I look around this neighborhood and I see the poor and the lowly, the humble, the downtrodden, people that are suffering. Each and every day there are people in these neighborhoods, in Queen Mary Park, in Central McDougal, in Boyle Street, the, the neighborhoods that are right here who desperately need to know that God loves them. And I think about this day of the Lord promise, and I think that day of the Lord for those people, that day of the Lord is now. Right? They're poor and humble and downtrodden and suffering right now. They need to know that God loves them, that wants, that the God that, that uh, sings love songs to His children is singing to them. They need to hear that song now. In fact, I think that 
the day of the Lord for them is now or it's never. Because there are people, those people, who are making choices, some of them that will make choices today, that are going to make it much tougher for them to hear the song. This year, literally, some of them have lost their lives and don't have the opportunity to hear the song. They can't hear anything. They're dead. There are people making choices about drug addictions that will make it much tougher for them to hear of God's love. And they're making those choices to go deeper into addiction today. There are people that are, because of the desperate situation that they're in, are making decisions about selling their bodies on these streets right here. And they will make those decisions tonight. And that's going to make it tougher. It doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it much tougher for them to understand how much they're loved. There's something very insidious about the selling of yourself for somebody else's sexual gratification that makes it tough for you to ever believe anybody loves you. I don't personally know how that works. I don't personally know if anyone would pay. I, I just know that, <laughs> that uh, I haven't had to experience that. But there are people making that tough decision in this neighborhood. Well, those are the, the downtrodden, the humble, the lowly. You don't get much lower than that. But when I read this passage, what I read is a, a bright beacon of hope, as, as tough as that sounds, as difficult as that sounds, as hard as that sounds, what I read in this passage is not a message of sadness, it's a message of incredible hope. That God wants to come to those people and sing over them, to sing them a love song, each of them individually, that He loves every one of them so much that He died for each and every one of them. And no matter how difficult their lives are, no matter how miserable their circumstances, no matter how rotten some of their choices, God loves them. And I think that many of them would make different choices, would lead different lives, would, would be examples of God's presence, if only they understood how much they were loved. I don't think, I'm not the kind of person who thinks every single one of them would turn in. Some of them would say, no thank you. Not interested. I can handle it myself. I honestly believe that. But I do believe that some of them would change. Some of them are desperate to change. They just don't know they can. So, here's what I, where I think that the, the church comes in. Because when I read the New Testament, and I understand the New Testament pretty well, I think. And when I read through the New Testament, what I see is I see a Jesus who says that the day of the Lord is at hand. Repeatedly, he says, the kingdom of heaven, the day of the Lord, the kingdom of God is at hand. That is, it's so close that you can reach out and touch that. And he said it while he was alive. That was a repeated theme in his preaching and ministry. That the day of the Lord is right there, so close that you can touch it. You know what I think it came? Partially. The, the real end, full celebration will wait till we're in heaven. But the day of the Lord arrived in part the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And it arrived in another part on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit first filled the church. And it arrived in another part in Acts 11, which we're going to study as a Sunday school class in the senior high this morning, when the church first started to spread from the Jews and to the Gentiles. And the message took that leap from being a a message that the people of God are from this chosen nation to the people of God include everybody. A work that the Holy Spirit initiated. All of that's in Acts 11. We're, so the, the kingdom of God is here in some ways. The day of the Lord has arrived. And then I think about the situation that I just described with the people in this neighborhood who for them, it's now or it's never. If the day of the Lord isn't today, if God isn't willing to sing them a love song today, they may make a choice tonight that makes it impossible for them to ever celebrate. They may be left a vegetable by an overdose, or they may be shot. They may literally make a choice tonight that makes it impossible for them to ever turn back. 
And with that in mind, and the idea that the day of the Lord was at hand at the time of Jesus, and that it arrived in some way with his death and resurrection, that it arrived in some way with the Holy Spirit filling us as a church and making us the living body of Christ. And the necessary element of the presence of God living among the downtrodden people, I think that the presence of God that needs to live among the downtrodden people of this neighborhood is this. It's us. We're it. We are the body of Christ. I think that God wants to sing a love song to those people, but He wants to use your mouths. And while in heaven, He will come and personally sing to each and every one of His children. I believe it. He's going to come and sing a love song over us in heaven. It's going to be beautiful. It'll be better than my singing, I promise. It, it's going to be amazing. It'll be incredible. I, I think there will not be a dry eye anywhere in the heavens. You'll weep with joy when God sings over you. I, I think, I go so far as to believe that every song is going to be different. Every song is going to be that perfect song for you. Mine's going to be a bit rock and roll. It's not, maybe for some viewers it's going to be a little bit of hip hop. I don't know. Mine won't have any hip hop. And it will certainly not have any country. But to each their own. I think that God will sing a song that, that makes sense to each and every one of his children. It's going to be beautiful. But I think right now, today, there are people that need to hear the message of God's love. And the way that he chooses to deliver that is through his body. The living presence of God does live among the people in this neighborhood. Right here. The living God is here right now. He's in this gathering. He's in your hearts. You're the living representation of God. Thank you.